art at his farm, which involves, um, you know, vending things, once every three months. So we can only go there once every three months. So the first official gathering at his farm will be in July, July 10th. Got it, which is the country fair weekend, which we are all boycotting, I hope. <laughs> and um, this first one is just kind of a gathering and a warm up and a fun day. So now what we need to do is find other farms so that we can rotate our uh, market. You know, we need two more farms so we can do it you know, every third time at Austin and the other places. So if you know any people with farms who you think might be candidates and interested in having us, um, talk to Karen or me or Scott, who's not here. Um, yeah, and any questions about what we're doing or, yeah. Could you give the address again? The address uh, let me see if the address is on the page. Right on the board. Oh, it's on the board, okay. 74. Oh, yeah, uh, 84674. Eight, Cloverdale Road in Cresswell. Yeah, and it, the sign out there is very subtle. So yeah. um, it's made out of metal with, you know, kind of carved out stuff and it takes a looking to find it. They have a very nice website, My Brother's Farm. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, and also if anybody knows people who want to uh, bend, so that could be um, produce, it could be uh, plants, it could be crafts, it could be flea market kind of stuff. So it's just a great opportunity to do vending and there'll probably be some kind of a fee for the vendors. We haven't worked that out. That's what we're going to work out on, on Sunday. Um, what's that? One gold back. That's right. Yeah, one gold back. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to encourage them to take gold bats too. They will have maybe frame a couple of them around, you know, try to get people to take them. Um, yeah, so we need we need the word to get out for vendors. And I think on the table there, there's, um, yeah, thank you, Mindy, those little flyers that if you know people who might be interested in vending, take some of those, give them to your friends, give them to possible vendors, and uh, hope to see you all there on Sunday the 12th. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yes, I put, uh, there's more on the back table here with other information, of course, as usual. Uh, these flyers, I've put them in little packs of 10, so take that whole pack with you. And it doesn't have to be just vendors, but if you go to a store somewhere, um, anybody who is vending um, may, may come for anything, um, like, like Morris said, crafts, uh, produce, plants, services. I'd like to have a knife sharpener for one. Anybody um, who is freedom-minded, that would be wonderful. Let's see if I want to add anything else to that. Um, yes, so the 7th, uh, this Tuesday uh, at 11 a.m., same address, of course, at Austin's Farm, my brother's farm. Uh, we are going to have a fun work party, so it's going to be a dump run. We'll just be having a nice time, and maybe we'll have some music and whatnot, and just uh, pretty the place up and get get ready for that Sunday. It's going to be very very exciting. Let's see here, uh, and I will after I have Karen. I think I'll have Dan come up and talk about those old backs too. Um, Karen, are you ready, Mom? Thank you. talk about backyard chicken raising and uh, even those of us who have chickens learn something so thank you again Mindy we had a good turnout and we decided on a couple of things oh well actually only real one thing that we're going to try to do and that is a gorilla park market we're going to try to start a uh, 
Well, start doing a produce exchange or sale at our local parks. And so we decided that the first one is going to be June 26th, 12 o'clock, at Maury Jacobs Park. And it'll be oh just fun. We'll bring, we'll picnic, we'll set our tables up, and we'll just have a good time and uh, see if we can share our our produce and whatnot, more than just produce, you know, anything you want to bring. And uh, so we hope everybody here, all of the Freedom, Freeland County people will join us. Um, there, I will just make a little announcement. There will be a, an open house at Wintergreen Farm in Notai tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. Uh, that's about all I know about it, but some of us are planning on attending so we can see how they do what they're going to do and see if we can pick up any pointers. So, is it 11? 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock. Wintergreen Farm in no time. Potluck. Potluck? Oh dear. Okay. Um, so I just wanted to say a word or two about the sustainers. Um, we're, we've been very interested in working on projects that will help to sustain us during difficult times. And um, that involves food security and, and making medicine and uh, growing our group um, so that we can create a community that we can be a part of at all times. Um, so I wanted to say about another aspect of sustainability, which is the spiritual side. Very, very important. Um, just the fact that we're getting together. Well, I'll just say that what I've found during this whole two-year period, I have not felt lonely. I have not felt any of the things that I feel, or that I hear other people talking about, you know, when they've isolated themselves and all that. I haven't felt that at all. I've been just happy, very, very happy, even though I feel sad about what's going on. My own personal life is very good because of the community that we've, that we've been building. So my, my daughter had to have some emergency surgery a couple weeks ago. And there was such a wonderful outpouring of prayer and good wishes for her. And it, I can't help but think that it, it's just a real, real thing. She felt like when she came out of surgery, she felt like that a bunch of other people were in the surgery room with her, having surgeries at the same time that she was. So much she believed that, that when she came to, she asked the nurse, how did everybody do? And the nurse, <laughs> the nurse just thought she meant, you know, the surgeons and the nurses, but she meant that she really felt like there were a bunch of people in the surgery with her. And I can't help but believe that it was all the prayers, all the people thinking strongly of her going through that. And it was just like, it just made me realize how important it is, that spiritual side too. So it's not just about the material, it's also about our minds. And so I just wanted to say a couple words about that. Amen. Um, <laughs> So, uh, our next meeting, well, our meetings are always on the first Wednesday of the month. And I don't know what date that is, but uh, we need to have, it would be nice to have someone uh, volunteer to host the meeting. And we had about 20 people at our meeting last time. It will be July 6th. July 6th, thank you. Thank you. July 6th, our next sustainer meeting. And uh, I'll just have to send out a message and let you know where it's going to be and what's, what's going to happen about that. 
Uh, we're going to be, the sustainers are going to be spending a lot of time helping with the Freedom Market. So we have a lot of things going on with that this month. Um, anyway, uh, any questions about our group? Otherwise, I will just, I'll go. Oh, 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 sorry. So we've decided to try to uh, let Friday, uh, Friday meetings be a place where we exchange um, plants, produce. We got our seed bank over here. We got um, bulk seed too. I brought lettuce from my garden and some chives and other people brought a bunch of plants. So please check it out. And um, yeah, that's it. Oh, okay, good. Um, as Maura pointed out, um, if you'd like to barter the things you brought, that's good. Um, and there's a donation box if you'd like to just donate to Freeland County. Um, and if you did bring stuff over here and it doesn't get taken, please take it home with you. What's your email address for that? Or website? Um, we don't have a website. Okay. Um, uh, I can forward any sustainer questions um, to our, our regular free free lane county at Oton now or PM.me. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. reply to the Breathe Free Lane County um, email where you get your updates from me and I can forward anything to the appropriate people. We don't have uh, separate emails at this point. We're <laughs> on a website right now, which is fine. You know, we want to be off, off about that st stuff anyway. But if anybody wanted to be part of the Telegram group, I've got this thing up here, but it's not really important. It's more important that we meet here. Um, and I can send out those emails. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, that produce show is fantastic. And I think we'd like, yeah, we'd like to bring those and uh, do a park market thing, set up a different parks. Uh, I think Maury Jacob is the first one we'll do. And um, if, if we have a sunny Saturday, then we can start that up again. And that will be uh, planned and executed by uh, Dean and hopefully Steve and Paige can help out with that. I'm going to talk to them about that. Just call them out right now. <laughs> Hopefully they can help out because I'm exhausted with that. And um, yeah, uh, let's see here. That gets on the subject of our speaker today. Uh, let's see. I felt like there was something else I wanted to get across before that. Um, I do want to piggyback on the spiritual side and sustaining the spiritual side is so immensely important. Years ago, uh, it was 2003, I had a pancreas transplant and um, I had been working in um, a museum in San Diego and I had a large group of uh, friends, people, uh, co-workers who became very close friends and the staff at the hospital had never seen anybody recover so quickly from a transplant because I had a room decorated with cards and flowers and lights and everything and it was just really wonderful people coming in and out to give me love and thinking about me and you feel that it's so so real which is why us being together here is so immensely important um, yeah with that we've got everything so let's see here the freedom mark has been talked about I want to talk about it more and it's so excited um, Let's see here. Um, yeah, on that note, maybe I should tell everybody I am. I'm having another surgery on the 16th. I'm trying to schedule it in between so I don't have to miss anything. But uh, it's C6, C7, um, a disc replacement in my neck. So that's apparently the easiest neuro spine surgery. So I should be okay. But I'll take prayers for that too. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, okay, enough about me. Let's move on to Mindy. And uh, she's going to give us a little case report and tell you about the ham sandwiches postcards. This is really brilliant. Thank you, Mindy. Um, okay. So I'm just going to say for the new people, I've been uh, uh, the subject of a lot of attention by the city of Eugene and now the state of Oregon 
for not complying with the mask BS that we've been under for a year up until the 1st of, of March, or maybe it was the 12th of March. Um, anyways, I've got the state of, of Oregon, uh, Patricia Perlow, our district attorney, is, um, she thinks that there's a case against me for uh, trying to attend a last minute hearing at Eugene Municipal Court on February 16th of, of this year, uh, where the guards in the courthouse just didn't want to let me in. And it, it was more than a, a mask issue because the one gentleman who made uh, the accusation that I, um, I think it was shoulder, uh, checked him, which I don't even know what that word means, but uh, anyways, he said to me, you don't have any business here in the courthouse. Well, yes, I did have business. I, I was about to attend a, um, a hearing at 10.30, and I was there at 10 o'clock. So anyways, uh, I have sent a um, uh, demand to cease and desist to Patty Perlow, and she is ignoring everything. Uh, she doesn't care. So I know this is a political um, attack because of the mask issue. And uh, yeah, I'm not complying with anything. Um, and nobody should. It's your body, your choice. So this campaign, uh, my husband and I thought of, is uh, the postcards say, we can and do prosecute ham sandwiches. And some people may not know where that comes from, but um, uh, so here's a quote. In one of my favorite books, The Bonfire of the Vanities, author Tom Wolfe quotes, New York State Chief Judge Sol Watchler, who said that a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich if that's what you wanted. And that was a quote from back in the 80s. Right. Um, so I'm ripping off that great quote and instead using the word prosecute because that's what they're doing. There is no case against me and um, unfortunately the city of Eugene was successful in prosecuting me and getting six um, jury members to uh, find me guilty even though they never saw me. They never, uh, they never saw anybody at the defendant's table. I was ripped out of that courtroom and put in an empty courtroom. So unless I can get rid of this case, um, it's gonna be more of the same. And so these postcards um, are, they're already written uh, the address to Patricia Perlow and um, we're paying for the stamps. We put the stamps on them. So um, they're on the top of the back of the card. It says, just drop the charges on Melinda Stone. And if you can just, you know, write a little note um, that this is, there's no case against Melinda Stone, that she's done nothing wrong. Um, my husband is making like a, a quarter page front back flyer so that I can hand them out with a prepaid postcard so that people can sit down, read, maybe check out my website, which is called, called freemasklessmindy.com. And it's not a great website. I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> I need to put stuff on it. But, um, you know, I'm really trying to do everything. And there's just not enough hours in the day. But um, if you could do that for me, uh, it would be great. Um, we want to flood uh, Patty Perlow's um, office with these cards because she has the opportunity to see that people are not buying this, that this is an unjust prosecution, that there are actually real criminals um, that should be gone after and put behind bars, um, not me. Um, so, Mark, you can you can just put your name at the bottom. If you want to put your address to let her know where you live, that's great, and just put it at the at the end of your letter. Um, but yeah, I'm praying. We might uh, we bought. I think we have. I want to say a thousand 
or 2,000 cards, and we can get more made up. Um, but, you know, the, the city of Eugene alone has 157,000 people. So, it you know. Like they would like to know that whoever sends these is a county resident. Yeah, that's, that could be. But if they do see that I'm letting people know about this in Salem and in uh, Corvallis, then she's going to know that I, mean, I may have 50 times the amount of support yeah. for this Lane County case than I did at the Muni Courthouse. And I don't think they want that kind of um, negative attention. Court support is the really the best way to try to end an unjust prosecution. Uh, they don't want the press coming, but you know what? The press is really not with us. They're, they're not responsive anymore since COVID. They are on the opposite side. They're supporting the agenda to mask us permanently. So um, this is, you know, this is a great experience. We have a lot of fun at our court events, don't we? Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> and now I know how to talk to the judge and let the quote unquote judge understand that I'm a sovereign being and they have no jurisdiction over me, and I'm not going to be contracting with them to put myself behind bars. So, anybody wants to know more about becoming sovereign, uh, please let me know. I'm learning a lot from Christopher Hauser in Tennessee, and I, you know, I'm blessed that I know that this is a battle, good versus evil, whatever you believe. I, you know, it's your creator. But I do believe that this is an ongoing war. And I just found out today that um, Alameda County, starting today in California, is bringing the masks back. So, you know, it's coming. But, but we can stop it. Yeah. Is Patty an elected official? She is elected. All district attorneys, they actually work uh, under the attorney general. Um, so we have 36 district attorneys in Oregon for the 36 counties. Um, so yeah, she is supposed to be representing the attorney general. And I have even conditionally accepted the attorney general and the governor because she, uh, the district attorney is aware of everything about my first case and my second case. So it's just a, a you know, it's a willful attempt to throw me under the bus, and I'm not going to go quietly. So she's up for election in two years? Is that I think maybe next year, right? Is it? Next year's a special election. Usually that's okay. kind of like school board and minor. Oh, okay. So yeah, every two years or? Yeah, okay. So it's probably three or four years since she got Oh, okay. right. Yes, I think you're right. So, but, but we can't wait for that, right? No, but that's something when you write these postcards, remind her, oh. I'm a voter. I'm not voting for you if you're gonna prosecute against people's civil rights. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I, I'll include that on the back side of my flyer because I'm just trying to give people ideas on, you know, how to how to tell her why this is not a justifiable prosecution. So thank you for that. Does anyone else have any questions? No? If you would help to uh, uh, put pressure on Sure. Oh, the sh well, the sheriff, unfortunately, the sheriff is very pro-mask. Um, he allowed his deputies in the courthouse to uh, threaten me with arrest if I didn't put a mask on for the arraignment for this case. Um, and I did file two complaints against the two deputies that harassed me, and they wrote me back saying there was no... Um, there was nothing wrong, even though I had video and I shared the video links. They didn't, they weren't doing anything wrong. So, sheriff's a problem. Mm -hmm. But the, the commissioners, you can let them know. Yeah, anyone else? Cool, well thank you very much. Uh, let me know if you need postcards and I'll have those little flyers that go with the cards next Friday. Yes, um, that was a good comment, Maura, thank you. Um, 
maybe you don't have to put down your whole address, but at least to put, um, hold on, thank you so much. Um, and uh, yeah, at least to put out where you are from, your name is, you know, your, your, your area, um, even if it's just like, hey, we'll run River Road or we'll run this area, um, that's fantastic. And just add anything you want. Um, Uh, Mindy, uh, do you have a, a date for a meeting at the Santa Fe Marca with the postcards and information? Um, Are you still doing that? I, oh yeah, that's probably going to happen starting the next weekend once we have our flyers. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah sorry. sorry. So we're going to have a banner that says um, Justice for Mindy, and we're going to have these postcards and these flyers to hand out at the farmers markets, uh, Eugene farmers market starting next weekend and maybe we'll mosey over to Freedom Plaza where we're gonna table, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. We do plan to, uh, we wanted to do it tomorrow, the Freedom Plaza Saturday market, um, so maybe next weekend we'll do it and so I get the word out, we can add that. Thank you so much, Mindy. If there is something else, um, I know I'd like to have Dan talk on the bullbacks again. Come on up. Make you get up out of your chair. <laughs> So basically, I'm trying to replicate me. 
So the more people who can do this, spread the word, the faster this concept will be accepted. I Why find, is that good? What? Why is that good? Because the more people who understand the value of this will have this in currency, and so we'll be trading with each other. We need to have like a million of these in circulation in Oregon to make it, that's my, I just took that on the top of my head. But the more of these are, the more people have of these and circulating and passing it around, the more viable it becomes as a local currency. Now, right now you'll see either Utah, Nevada, or New Hampshire. And I just say, well, if you buy a you know, Cougarand from South Africa or a maple leaf from Canada, it's still gold. It's the same price. So it doesn't matter what's on it. Uh, Wyoming and South Dakota are the next two states. Um, at some point, I would like to get people interested in uh, getting some legislation here in Oregon. There's two laws we need to pass in Oregon. One is for Oregon to um, uh, eliminate capital gains on buying and selling of gold and silver. Because technically, uh, okay, if you bought this for $4 and you traded it for five, you owe taxes on that $1 difference. But that's the first thing we need to do. We shouldn't be paying taxes right now. I agree with you. And the second thing that, that Utah and Nevada has done is they, they got the legislature to agree to follow the U.S. Constitution. And that is the only legal tender in America is gold and silver. That's in the U.S. Constitution. And so those two pieces of legislation made it, people walking around with these in Utah and they spend them like cash. Vendors accept it because it's approved by the state. Now, we don't really need to get an approval by the state to trade in gold. It's, um, it's a currency. It is, it is a currency that historically, uh, at least in the Western world, we've agreed upon, we, we trade with this. Some people like silver. That's another possibility. I'm not against it. You could add it. I just said the gold. Yes. So do you need to pass the two, the two laws in order to make the currency? No, local currency is legal in every state. There's no law against this. These are produced in Portland, the manufacturing in Portland. Oh, okay. yeah. So we, how, do we, how do we get one with Oregon? No, no, no. no we'll, have to, we'll have to find somebody in the state legislature to sponsor a bill that's similar to Utah and Nevada and New England. Um, so as far as I can tell, it seems like the main benefit of using these is so that we can continue to trade in the marketplace when everything goes digital, when the currency goes digital. That's the number one reason, exactly. So we still have an agreed upon way of trading with each other. This is $4 for anybody who wants to pay $4 for the produce or whatever you got. And, the, and local currencies work best when uh, it's traded with somebody who's local, who has a service and a product that is local. Like one of the vendors says, I can't take this because I can't put it in the bank. I go, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You don't want to put it in the bank. You want to avoid the bank. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Keep it local. Keep it local. Um, and and uh, if you go, I'm not sure I want to do this, well, you can buy it for four bucks and then turn it around on eBay and sell it for a profit immediately. With that here locally yet? I have, I have, I have, no, no, no. You know, you, you, you want to only trade with people who live in Eugene who are offering a service or a product made in Eugene. You don't go to Safeway and say, Can I buy this product from Chile? No, you don't do that. Saturday market. I have I have donated one of these to every single vendor in the farmers market. 
So they already know. They've seen this. They have one of these. In fact, when I go and say, uh, will, you, will you take this? I go, oh, I still have the one you gave me last time. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking about it. People have to think about this. They have to look at it. Probably 20% of the people I give this to, their eyes light up. They know exactly what I'm up to. And they snatch it up. They go, yes, yes. I recognize this. It looks like gold. It feels like gold. It is gold. It's currency. I want it. Uh, for me to go, the only person going up and down the farmer's market and saying, will you take this, will you take this? I look like a kook who's just trying to push something, you know? Yeah. But if I got 10 people, each one after the other, going, hey, take this, then the vendor's going to go, oh, maybe there's something to this. Maybe I should think about this. Because the public is into this. And maybe I should consider it. And I also give these little flyers, it's updated. Uh, it gives a very good argument for why we should be thinking about this and actually taking action on this. I'll have you send that flyer to me. Uh, there's one, which is four dollars. There's a five, which is twenty bucks. So multiply it by. And um, I actually give a little discount if you buy uh, um, twenty dollars worth of these. It's five. And you give me forty dollars. I give you eleven. I sell them. Dan wanted two of the plants that I brought, so he gave gold bats in exchange. Wow. And Michelle did not complain. Until last legal session, the Oregon State Legislature had a law 
that if you were a concealed carry holder, they could not restrict your access. That law was changed, Senate Bill 554, which had a bunch of other things, and then this is one of those little things that was tucked in at the end. Oh, and by the way, schools can now create their own rules about concealed carry. So the school district has to make a rule to change it, um, and 4J is trying to do that. Why now? Um, I don't know, maybe they knew there was a bunch of mass shootings that were scheduled for the next couple weeks, and it was a good time where they could guarantee that it would pass. I don't know. Um, That's right. I, I, I don't know. But it, it does seem awfully convenient that all this happens, and then right behind it, everybody's got legislation and policies ready to push. So That's right. um, it is a spiritual warfare, and, and it, it's, it's tough because they don't want people to come together. They don't want these groups to meet. They don't want us to feel supported and to show that there's a voice, and there's a collective voice outside of what they call the collective and the greater good. And so um, 4J is in an interesting point. Uh, I ran for the board last year. I ran against Laurel O'Rourke. She won, um, she's on the board now, and she's doing an awful job. And I say that objectively. It has nothing to do with, with our race. I, I don't care, I, I wish, I wish that she was doing a better job. Even though I disagree with her, I wish she was doing a better job because I wanna see a functional school district. Um, she, she currently has three complaints and a union grievance filed against her, and she says it's because she's the, the black and then there's a Latina woman on the board and they're the target of everything because they're the black and Latina woman on the board. The 4J district is racist because they speak against the black and Latina woman on the board. The 4J board members are racist because they speak against the black and Latina member on the board. The Democratic Party is racist. <laughs> Be start. Because they speak against the Latina and black woman on the board. Right. Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly racist because I speak against the black and Latina woman on the board. And everybody in this room is a member of a hate group because some people showed up to the meeting on the 17th. And after they finished the 10 hand-selected people for public comment, they said, okay, we're going to move on. And myself and Ibra and a few other people stood up and said, hello. There's 20 people in this room that want to speak about a policy that you've proposed to pass tonight that you haven't heard one single comment on. And by standing up and asking for our public participation to be included with all the other teachers that were speaking about passing English language curriculum, well, there was, a, there was five people, I found it counted five in a row that all spoke about the same thing. And you have to put the topic down when you request to speak. So they knew that they had all these teachers lined up to speak against this one thing. And they knew that I had signed up to speak, but they didn't want to hear what I had to say. Um, they're, they're tired of hearing from me. So when we, when we stood up and, and, and we asked, hey, can we be heard? Laurel stood up on the stage and she said, Harry, you're inciting this crowd. And I said, what's wrong with that, Laurel? You do that every meeting. Is it because of the color of my skin? Is that why you're tone policing me? OPB, and then KLCC because they pick up OPB, the Register Guard, double-sided media, which is one-sided, and uh, Michelle Hsu, the new school board member, her husband works for them, uh, all picked up Laurel's and the board's lies about me that I targeted Laurel because of the color of her skin and I tried to incite a crowd of gun-carrying hate group fanatics. They, they called, Laurel called every group member there a hate group. Um, that I was trying to incite violence against them. And she was in tears, she had to find a, a hotel room over the weekend, and um, the police had to come and then check out her house and do a security audit, and she was turning her cameras on. The funny thing is, is I sat in that meeting for another two hours, and, and Misty and Sean sat right next to me, and I, I believe both of them had their concealed carry. It, there was no problem in that room while we were there. But after the meeting, there was, a non-credible, it was not a credible threat, unless somebody, maybe somebody sent an email that I'm unaware of. But, but this goes to the problem. There is no transparency and there is no accountability on 4 chain That goes way beyond what's happened with COVID and what's happening now. This is a long-standing thing that many members of our community have had issues with and complained about, where a school official is not hearing this bullying going on and is not doing anything about it, and the parent goes to 4 chain and 4 chain goes, eh, and, and so this is not new. 
But it is happening, and I think there's like a critical mass that we might be able to swell up now and do something about it. So I'm demanding accountability and transparency from them. Um, I, I am considering legal action because they have lied about me. They said I called Leroy a black woman. I never did that. I asked if it was the color of my skin, and then Laurel wrote about it, so it's also libel. Defamation. Yes. So, so there's a, a slant, in my opinion, a slam dunk defamation suit, but knowing the state of the courts, I don't know if I want to go down that road. Um, but I have been expressing my concern to them. And when I was not selected to speak two nights ago, even though I hadn't spoke the meeting before, I asked them if this was retaliation because of what I said in the meeting before, because they have a non-discrimination policy that protects race, creed, color, everything under the sun, and prohibits retaliation. So they've singled me out. They spent a whole meeting on the 23rd, by the way. This is the good part. This is where they called people hate group. They spent a whole meeting on the 23rd talking about the security thing. They spent an hour talking about it. It wasn't on the agenda until that day. Um, so I didn't have a chance to go to that meeting. I heard about it afterwards and went back and watched it. And um, they, they talked about this issue and, and pretty much me in particular for about an hour. Which is just a blatant violation of the public process. You don't talk about a constituent and you don't talk about them when they're not present to defend themselves. And then you don't hold the next meeting and not even give them the token three minutes to give public comment about the slander that they level against them. Cowards. They are cowards. And Troy, you're famous because every everything that quotes what I said has your that's right comment. <laughs> well, Harry, the reason why is because I was there at that meeting with you in May, and what did they do? They bailed. They they said, they let's take a recess, and they all took off. We should take the their seats. I said was, let's get up there and take their seats. Yep. I did. Amen. And what did I do when we were outside standing up? I said, hey, they want a mask. I'll give them a mask. And I pulled out the Trump mask, and they got pictures in front of the side. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, Bunch of cowards. They, they are a bunch of cowards, and, and I, I have a suspicion that part of the reason they wanted to bring this gun issue to, to, to the board was they anticipated people showing up with guns to protest against it. And whether we stood up and spoke or not, just by being there with guns, they were going to say they felt unsafe and use that as justification for going back to virtual for the rest of the year, which they did. They're not meeting in person until the school year is done. And then to pass their, their policy and say, well, we were already threatened by guns, of course we need to get rid of them. They, they are such cowards, and they, and they don't care about the Second Amendment right. The grievance I have, beyond that, we all we, we showed up, we had 20 people show up. The way they spoke and that mean they were advised by their lawyer, you cannot ban somebody from meetings because you don't like their decorum or you don't like what they say. That is a First Amendment violation. If you have a public forum open to the public, it needs to be open to every single member of the public. That's right. Amen. I, ca I counted three of them. I have to go back and listen closely, but I counted three of them and said, so? Yeah. They said, oh, we might face a lawsuit. Can we do it anyways and see if the lawsuit comes to fruition? And, and to me, it's not offensive that they're willing to take on a lawsuit. Okay, you're going to take on a lawsuit. You have a lawyer. You feel emboldened. That's great. The, the problem here is you're going to take on a lawsuit because you could potentially be violating somebody's First Amendment right, and you're okay with that. Unbelievable. How, how are you in a public position when you're willing to risk violating somebody's First Amendment right when you've been advised by a lawyer you might be doing that? Um, so the board has an email. It's board at 4j.lane.edu. I'll give you that again. Board, B-O-A-B-O-A-R-D, at 4j.lane, L-A-N-E, dot E-D-U. And I would like to see everybody email them and ask them to please respect our Second Amendment, please respect our First Amendment, and to please provide transparency and accountability and we want to know why when there's multiple complaints against a board member that it's hidden under the rug, that nothing's made public, and that there is no resolution that, that can be seen. So as constituents, we're watching improper bad behavior up there on the stage, and then we're wondering why we're getting improper and bad behavior in our classrooms. Mm. It, 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 it follows, it's from the top down. If they don't set the example that our children are going to learn by, 
then our children aren't gonna learn the right thing. So um, that, that's the big concern. They're having a meeting on the 22nd, but odds are it's gonna be virtual. Um, and again, when it's virtual, a hundred of us could show up and the only people that know that are the people behind the screen. The public doesn't know that. So I've asked them to open their meetings and to allow the participants tab, if they're gonna be hidden on Zoom, allow the participants tab so we can see who's in that room with us. Allow the chat tab so we can chat with each other and express our disdain at the policy that they pretend they have a, a mandate to push forward uh, and show them that they don't. But until they, they, they have to enable that, or we don't have any power other than showing up at the, at the board meeting or showing up at the district offices while they're having a board meeting, but that's just for show. It, it doesn't do anything. And when you don't have the media in your pocket, it doesn't really do much good. So um, the other thing that is happening, that this is not an official 4J event, uh, but it's kind of being promoted as one, and it is at the North Eugene High School campus, is from three to six today, they're having a pride rally with a professional, professional drag show with student participants. Oh, no, which I think is completely inappropriate. Um, it's grooming. It's another one of those things where it's like, they want people to come up, show up and protest, and yell at kids, and, and so then they can say, well look, these people were targeting kids, they're violent extremists, and they need to be arrested. Um, so I'm hesitant to say like, yeah, let's all go show up with signs, but um, I saw somebody, thank you Liz, that said, um, if, if, if you want to go down there, I'll go down there with you and make sure that we are able to stand on the sidewalk, which is public property, and to voice our concern over what seems to be a completely inappropriate use of the school grounds. And I'd like to know, because their non-discrimination policy also says they can't restrict access to groups using their grounds because of, so, you know, what's the most, can, can we hold a gun rights rally at North Eugene High School next week? Can, can, we, can we hold a, a gun rights pride event? Um, can, can, we, can we hold a um, 1776 project rally where we uh, espouse the wonders of Donald Trump's curriculum and why the 1619 project is just flat out wrong, how it's an opinion piece parading as, as history? Um, you know, that, that's my question, is, is if they're gonna give this event the room to, to shine, then I think we should be able to put on something as well, but, um, yeah, that, that's 4J updated in a nutshell. Yeah, Bill. When my wife and I had our kid, there was never any question that we would submit our kid to the torture of the public school. I think the best thing we can do, if we want to disenfranchise his people, is to start organizing homeschooling or community schooling yes, projects. Yes, yes. They're not about teaching our kids skills. They're not about educating our kids about how to be uh, respectful and uh, functional human beings capable of, of interacting with each other in a productive way. They are about creating dependencies and bigotry. And we knew this way back in 1998. We read a book by John Taylor Gatto, who was awarded one of the best yeah. educators in New York City, yeah. and he advocated homeschooling. So we got to take our kids out of their reach and disenfranchise them. So, Bill, that, that's a great point, and I actually had my neighbor came up to me today and said her daughter's starting uh, something for K through two. And they're going to have a Waldorf teacher. There will be a cost to pay the teacher, um, but if you're interested in that, let me know, and I can find out more information. The, the, the problem is, I can take my kid out and put him in homeschool, right? That kid's going to grow up with all these other kids that are in that public school indoctrination system, though. And so unless we can fix that system and, and realign it to produce a better outcome for our community, we're going to all suffer from this in, in 10, 12 years. When these kids who are professional activists and professional, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, are all groomed to, to be anti-American and destroy our systems that we built in this country. And the other part of this is the school board is often a launching point towards future political careers. So four members are up for election next May. And I think we have to replace those four people with four 
reasonable, common sense candidates, and um, it's gonna take some money, but if you can raise that money and get those candidates, four people on the 4J board gives you a voting majority. So, you know, I, I, I think that what you said, we do need to develop alternatives, um, but at the same time, we can't just turn our back on a system that is going to keep putting its boot on our neck every time that we try to breathe. No, we need to do both. Yes, yes, that's that's what I said. I graduated from Vero Beach High School in Florida in 1986. I was um, in therapy by age 30 because I couldn't stay in college. I had very low self-esteem. Um, I came out of the 80s, which was all about your body image and uh, money was falling off trees during Reaganomics. Um, I cannot endorse public education because I'm a product of it. And it took me three years of therapy to understand that it's not me that's got a problem, it's the society around me. Now, if that was true then in 1986, my mother retired from teaching at Vero Beach High School after, uh, after 23 years, she could not handle two more to get her full pension. She said by 2002, she said, I can't do it anymore. It is such a hostile environment for teachers. And this is in Florida. So I'm sorry I'm going to join Bill in this uh, notion. If they don't have students to teach, they don't have a school board. So they're screwed. So, so thank you all. Reach out to me if you have more thoughts to share. Um, I, I would love to just come up with a better plan to, to move forward with this. Um, I, I'm kind of doing what I what I can do at the moment. So uh, help is always appreciated. Thank you so much, Mary.